right. So, this is where we are the uh, we are actually discussing only one paper so far in the last couple of modules the 1998 Jeff Iskeme paper of Takeuchi and Tahara. So, uh, we are doing that because we want to introduce the problem slowly and then later on we will just flash the papers and you will see how the quality of papers and number of papers change over time and then it is up to you to read them. So, the crux of the matter is that excitation is taking place to not one, but to two states and again when you said that this is not talking in the air there was some existing literature about uh, some uh, very well known sorophore. Okay. And the additional evidence that came here came in the form of fluorescence and isotropy. We all know that we excite by polarized light and then look at uh, parallel and perpendicularly polarized emission light you can get fluorescence and isotropy i parallel minus i perpendicular divided by r pa i parallel plus i 2 i perpendicular and this fluorescence and isotropy where is it used most of the time what does it stand for rotational relaxation right that is uh, i mean if there are at least in last 30 years if there are like n number of papers in uh, fluorescence and isotropy perhaps 0.9 n or more would be ab of about rotational uh, depolarization. But one of the very if you go back to early times look at very early papers on uh, fluorescence spectroscopy you will see fluorescence anisotropy has been put to use to address a more fundamental uh, issue. Rotation is not the only thing that causes depolarization. Why does this question of polarization arise? Why does the question of polarization arise in spectroscopy? Because as we know the most important quantity in spectroscopy is this. What is this quantity? Transition moment integral. I like to call it TMI. Different people call it different things mu and all. What is psi i? Psi i is the wave function of this state from which the transition originates. Initial, i for initial. What is psi f? Final wave function of the state to which the transition takes place. We are not even saying absorption or emission. And this mu is basically the dipole moment. So, dipole moment is a vector and can be resolved into x, y and z components. So, uh, a transition as we know takes place only when this transition moment integral is non-zero. And when we say this transition moment integral is non-zero, what we mean is one of these three integrals psi f, x, psi i or psi f, y, psi i or psi f, z, psi i. Of course, I should not say psi f x psi i it is integral psi f star x psi i d tau. One of these has to be non zero essentially and many transitions for many transitions only this transition is non zero while these may be zero or the other way around. Okay. In emission spectroscopy the idea is this you excite by say z polarized vertically polarized light and well excitation by vertically polarized light is better than horizontally polarized light if you are going to detect in 90 degrees. So, then uh, the issue is the when emission takes place if emission takes place from the same state since you have already uh, done photo selection you have already excited by z polarized light the emitted light should also have z polarization vertical polarization right. The thing gets messed up apparently if you use horizontally polarized light because if this is the polarization of excitation light this is the direction of propagation and when emission takes place from here the problem is generally you detect at 90 degrees if you detect in the same direction there is no problem. If you detect at 90 degrees then uh, this direction is the uh, polarization uh, is a direction of polarization of light as well and that messes up things completely both this as well as this are actually perpendicular. 
But coming back to the question in hand, you expect the emission to be completely z polarized vertically polarized if the emission is from the excited state. So, one thing that can happen is that the molecule can tumble before uh, can rotate before emission takes place and then starting from this polarization you can get emission in different directions and uh, that is where fluorescence anisotropy comes in uh, is of a great help to tell you whether uh, rotational depolarization is taking place or not. However, it takes some time for the molecules to rotate. If you are talking about time scales of less than picosecond, the molecule will move this much and not enough fluorescence depolarization will take place in that ultra short time due to rotation. However, suppose this is the situation where you excite yeah, and you excite to a state which has uh, some kind of a polarization and then there is an, a rapid excited state process ultra fast excited state process that takes it to another state which has some polarization in uh, transition dipole moment in some other direction. So, this is the direction of transition dipole moment of the locally excited state, this is the direction of the transition dipole moment of a state that is produced by some rapid excited state process, then what will happen? Then also you will have some depolarization and this depolarization will take place in ultra fast time scale which is not accessible to rotation. So, if you have a little slow depolarization then you can think that it is due to rotation something like tens of picosecond and longer. If you are talking about proteins and all it becomes nanosecond. However, if you have depolarization which is ultra fast 0.1 picosecond, 1 picosecond, 2 picosecond then it is not enough time for rotation. That means, you, there is some rapid transformation from one state to the other. Okay? Right. And it is actually known that this phenomenon takes place in some kinds of molecules. We will come back to that in a moment, but now let me show you the data of Takeuchi and Tahara fluorescence anisotropy data. This is the fluorescence decay excited at 380 nanometer. This is the rise followed by a long decay at lambda m 380 nanometer sorry sorry this is lambda fluorescence 380 nanometer excitation is at 270 nanometer excitation is at 270 nanometer benzenoid band and this is the first decay you see at 380 nanometer. This is the rise followed by a very slow decay that you see at 500 nanometer emission. Now, here this is the time evolution of anisotropy you see the first component and here the time evolution of anisotropy is slower it is associated with 12 picosecond. Right? So, when you look at 500 nanometer tautomer band the uh, fluorescence depolarization that takes place is mainly due to rotation. However, when you look at the locally excited state there is a very very fast component ultra fast component will tell you how much it is that cannot be due to rotation and the reason came from um, classical knowledge of this kind of molecules. It is known that 7 as indole has two very closely lying excited states singlet L a and singlet L b and for once again uh, as a result of experiments as well as calculations it was well established by that time that singlet L a has a transition moment uh, transition dipole moment in this direction singlet L b has transition dipole moment in this direction here we are talking about monomers do not forget. Okay. The excitation essentially is uh, absorption does not change much. Does this remind you of something? You have two transition moments one almost perpendicular to the other not exactly perpendicular and one we have why have we drawn a longer arrow in one case and shorter arrow in the other case double headed arrow because this one passes through more atoms this one passes through fewer atoms. So, this is called the long axis for the singlet L b state is known to have transition moment in uh, transition dipole moment along the long axis and singlet L a is known to have 
transition dipole moment along short axis, does that ring a bell? Long axis, short axis. Those of us who have studied uh, the spectroscopy of uh, naphthalene would perhaps remember that for naphthalene there are very well defined long and short axis uh, transitions at 90 degrees to each other perfect 90 degrees. Now, for 7 as indole and for tryptophan it is well known that you have this again this short axis long axis business it is just that the axes are tilted they are not exactly at right angles because the two rings are not the same. So, this idea of long axis and short axis and this closely lying excited state all this stems really from the uh, symmetry discussion of naphthalene energetics of naphthalene okay that is the, the starting point so those who might be interested we have discussed this naphthalene case in detail in our uh, symmetry and petal course symmetry in chemistry once again the lectures are freely available uh, on uh, youtube all right so this is this was known so what takeuchi and tahara said was a simple explanation tahara's group specializes in providing simple explanation in fact tahara san once told me that you should not think matters in a very complicated way and in his uh, uh, very typical manner he said i don't understand things that are complicated there has to be simple explanations for everything of course if you say that to a quantum chemist they might not agree but uh, that is not too bad an approach. So, what they said is this we know very well that there is singlet LB state which is a little higher lying state than singlet LA. So, singlet LB would be S2, singlet LA would be S1, yeah. And from the time resolved spectroscopic experiment that is there, their assignment was when you excite, you excite to this singlet LB that gets transformed to singlet LA without the proton being transferred. So, this is basically S2 to S1 vibrational cooling in 0 0.2 picosecond and then the double proton transfer takes place from this electronically relaxed S1 state singlet LA state of the dimer or rather I should say dimer of singlet LA states because after all the singlet and the singlet LA and singlet LB states are uh, defined for the monomer not the dimer and herein started the trouble because their interpretation was that the ultra fast component 0 0.2 picosecond is associated with sort of vibrational cooling say so, S2 to S1 non radiative transformation and the proton transfer is concerted both the proton gets get transferred at the same time proton transfer is not sequential but concerted 1.1 picosecond is the time associated with uh, transfer of both the protons together all right uh, note the time timeline is important here 1998 also note the page number 7740 jeff is okay and the reason why uh, that uh, was the beginning of some trouble was that already about three years ago and that is not the only paper by the way there was this 1997 uh, CPL paper and well as I said one reason I am very excited about it is that I read all these papers in real time uh, as they were published because that is when I was a student. Uh, the reason why this sparked of this debate is that two years prior to this CPL paper 1995 there was a paper published by uh, Duhal, Kim and Zuel in nature where they had studied the same 7 as a indole dimer in gas phase using mass spectroscopy. You can see the uh, setup here it is very uh, similar to the setup we have next to our lab in Professor Naresh Patwari's lab the only difference is that this is a time resolved mass spectrometer. Okay, same time of flight mass spectrometer, but time resolved with frame to second resolution. This is where a lot of that Nobel Prize winning work has been done. So, there 1995 is four years before Zuel's Nobel Prize when everybody knew that Nobel Prize was coming to this gentleman. That time this nature paper came where they said based on this mass spectroscopy data that they also got by the way the interesting thing is they got very similar time constant 0 0.2 
picosecond and 1.1 picosecond almost close to what Tahara's group had got, but based on the mass data they said that the 0 0.2 picosecond component is associated with transfer of 1 proton, 1.1 picosecond is associated with transfer of the second proton, so pKa1, pKa2, pKa2 kind of thing and then you get that automer. So, now the question was that Zoe's group said the proton transfer is sequential two step. Tahara's group said it is uh, concerted and preceded by S 2 to S 1 cooling, which one is correct. More or less around the same time 1998 again Castleman is a very well known name in this field. Castleman's, Castleman's group in Penn State did some experiment once again on mass spectroscopy and it is very easy to understand what they did and perhaps it is not very difficult to understand where the problem lies here. So, what they said is this you take a monomer the mass is 118 amu. If a proton gets transferred then the protonated species has a mass of 119 amu, the deprotonated species has a mass of 117 amu it is as simple as that. When both the proton gets transfer, transferred what is the mass again both have 118. So, what they their argument was based on the fact that if I look at that 119 amu fragment how much of it is there in relation to 118 fragment they said this is the evidence of single proton transfer species ok and this is what they got. Can you read the y axis? Can you read the x axis time delay in femtoseconds very easy to understand. Can you read the y axis? Ratio of masses 119 to 118 and there they see a rise and that is associated with 663 femtosecond. So, they said yes it is sequential first one proton gets transferred otherwise why are we getting 119 amu. So, uh, the problem of course, with this experiment is that you are differentiating 118 and 119 with femtosecond resolution. So, is the data really that good right that skepticism is going to come, but this is what Kesselman's group said anyway. But then do not think that these are only gas phase experiments that said that it is sequential. Zuel also did experiments in solutions, Zuel's group and they did in different solvents. So, this is these are uh, the papers that I am not going to discuss in detail, uh, but I strongly advise that you read this then only you will understand uh, the uh, intricacies of this discussion. Several studies mostly by uh, in one case when Duhal was in Zuel's lab in another case when Duhal went back and their groups co collaborated every time yeah same Duhal every time Abdul Razak Duhal every time they said it is sequential. So, this is the debate this is what it is all about is it concerted Tahara model is it stepwise Zuel model. And then well to somebody who of course, you know in any field understand the importance of anything if you are interested in it. So, to an outsider this might seem to be frivolous well, who cares who cares if it is one at a time or both at a time, but it is not frivolous at the end as, as promised we will discuss what all we have learnt. And one evidence that this was not frivolous, but rather a very interesting thing in this uh, uh, in this community was that father figure one of the father figures of fluorescence when you say fluorescence this is the name that comes to your mind Michael Kasha actually got into this. 1999 Kasha's group published a paper and it is not only Kasha Catalan Catalan is also a very major player. Catalan and Kasha and all they published a paper and this was published in PNS as you can see and this PNS paper was essentially a discussion of what these two groups had seen Zuel group and Tahara group. Please read this paper first of all it is the work of a master well commentary of a master Kasha 
and uh, what he said, I will just show you one part and I will read it. What it said is that Zuel group observed for 7 as indole dimers in solution a similar range of ultra fast and fast components for deuterated uh, dimer. So, Zuel group also did the deuteration work. Takeuchi and Tahara assigned this rate to vibrational cooling by analogy to established rates for IVR for analog analogous hydrocarbon molecules. So, as you know every research is really linear combination of previous knowledge and something more. So, you cannot really do anything in the air. So, that is what Tahara had done. The Zuel group adopted the deficient RHF calculation results. So, one of the main strengths of Zuel's work was whenever you do any gas phase work to understand it you have to do calculations, quantum chemical calculations and uh, quantum chemical calculations are very helpful, but if you are not careful or if you are if you are biased towards a particular result you want to see, you actually get to see the result you want to see. So, for an RHF calculation results for an intermediate reaction potential minimum exaggerated in their figure, in their figure 1 and interpreted all of the dynamics data accordingly. Takeuchi and Tahara took full account of the exact 7 as I uh, lowest molecular energy states involved analogous to the S1 LB and S2 LA states of isoelectronic naphthalene. Takeuchi and Tahara omit the lower AG electronic state preserving the upper BU split components of S 1 U and S 1 B because the S 0 singlet AG to S 1 A doublet AG transition is electric dipole forbidden and is observed as a biphotonic transition as we have discussed above. As the dipole moments are rotated in plane in the PT tautomer excited state, the AG and BU components reverse order, there is a reversing of orders that takes place. The S1U state metastability contributes to the tautomerization dynamics and is the state from which tautomerization occurs in the dimer. So, Kasha actually said at that point itself that for solution, he did not want to comment uh, on the gas phase results, but for solution the conclusion of Takeuchi and Tahara is much more trust reliable. That is what uh, Kasha had to say at that point. But this was immediately followed up by a paper on Kasselman where he uh, where he stood his ground and uh, sort of defended their stand. So, this is like a war of giants. Michael Kasha was a member a fellow of National Academy of Science USA since 1971, Kasselman had just become at that time a uh, fellow of the academy. And this really got eyeballs and this is something that I usually do not show in any presentation, but in this case just to bring out how the kind of interest it generated, I show you how drastic was the increase in uh, the number of papers in related fields until 92 nothing, and slowly it goes up and from here it just takes off. And most of this work was about this debate, is it concerted, is it stepwise. Then Tahara's group did some experiment, what they said is this, okay, fine, we are saying that when we excite, we excite to uh, two different states. So, now if I change the excitation wavelength, then what happens? If you have something like this, where the absorption spectrum is uh, made up of absorption spectra for S0 to S2 and S0 to S1 transitions. And this is of course, a cartoon representation. Their contention was that if I excite here, then I will excite primarily to S2. If I excite here, I will excite primarily to S1. So, when I excite here that 0 0.2 picosecond should be seen if it is S2 to S1 transition. If I excite in the red end of absorption spectrum, it should not be seen. Yeah. Uh, however, if it is only one state that is excited to and if the 
proton transfer is actually sequential, then no matter where you excite, you should still see two time constants 0 0.2 picosecond and 1.1 picosecond. Of course, this is easier said than done. This is what you want to do. This here is the absorption. You want to excite at different places and that is what they did. They started with 270 nanometer, then 280, 287, 293, 300, 307, 313. Now, do not forget that the problem here is that again saying the same thing again and again, you are exciting with an ultra fast pulse, it is not monochromatic. Okay. So, it is important to do a lot of experiments and when you excite here 270 nanometer, you cannot go here, you cannot go to 260 because there is hardly any absorption. So, this was a difficult experiment, not at all an easy experiment and, and data analysis was also not at all easy, but I will show you what they get. This is what they got, they com what is compared here is the decays of up conversion, femtosecond up conversion upon excitation at 287 nanometer, 300 nanometer, 313 nanometer and look at the decays, these are not normalized. These are not peak normalized. If anything, they are tail matched. So, see the tails are matched very nicely. What is this tail? 1.1 picosecond component. So, if the second case is correct, that 0 0.2 as well as 1.1 picosecond, both are associated with proton transfer, the first one and the second one, then these decays should have become superimposable. A tail match decay would also get peak normalized, a peak normalized decay would also get tail matched. That is obviously not the case. And when you excite at 287 nanometer and when you excite at 330 nanometer, what is the difference? Contribution from the ultra fast component is more when you excite at 287 nanometer. And next step is how you represent your data. It is not enough to have data. What you say is important how you say it also important, right. So, they did it beautifully by making log normal plots and in log normal plot this is the this is data, right, actual data. You get to get this kind of data in up conversion, third harmonic excitation is very, very difficult, you can understand that. So, this required very careful experiment and then in semi log plots what they did is these lines that you see these lines come when you have this 1.1 picosecond time constant, right. Uh, so, in semi log plot 1.1 picosecond time constant decay would look like a line with the corresponding slope. So, for 313 nanometer excitation, you see the decay is coincident with this line. As you go towards blue, ex I mean higher energy excitation, there is a deviation in the smaller time scale. That is because when you excite at 280 nanometer, the decay is by exponential. You get 0 0.2 picosecond as well as 1.1 picosecond. When you excite at 313 nanometer, there are excitation wavelength remember, the decay is single exponential, only 1.1 picosecond component is there, right. So, this is the thing. Moreover, they also looked at anisotropy. When you excite at 313 nanometer, anisotropy decay also is almost single exponential and long lived associated with that 12 picosecond component, which is for rotation. When they excited at 270 nanometer, you see there is an initial ultra fast component 0 0.2 picosecond. So, that 0 0.2 picosecond turns out to be the time constant as well as the time constant associated with anisotropy decay. That is what is telling you that one state gives makes way for the other with this 0 0.2 picosecond time constant and that is associated not with or not only with decay of population, but also change in direction of transition moment integral uh, well uh, transition dipole moment. That is why your uh, you see it here. So, the see in long time these two are almost parallel right that is due to rotation anyway, but sh in short time if you get something like that, that tells you that in that time scale some excited state process is happening and that is seen only for well not only for that is seen prominently for excitation at higher energy not seen for excitation at lower energy, which means that when you excite at 313 nanometer you are not exciting the S2 state, 
you only excite the S 1 state. When you excite at 270 nanometer, you do excite the S 2 state, right. So, that was explained knowing the directions of all these uh, uh, transition moment integrals from calculations by Nakajima et al and other people like Waluk and all. And finally, this was the PNAS paper published in 2007, 10 years after the debate started. And there the title of the paper I think is something like the answer to concerted versus stepwise controversy for the double proton transfer mechanism of 7 as I indole dimer in solution and the answer is so simple. This is the answer to a 10 year long debate. Yeah. And so, from here they said that yes, it is definite that S 2 involvement is there. And see the change in quality of the paper also starting from later 1997, here we have this last paper in PNAS. It was not the end of the debate, because all right, uh, this is 2007 PNAS page number 5285, 2007 PNS page number 8703, where Zuel's group published one more paper defending their stand. I am not going into what they said, because by the time actually this is uh, not really the debate raging on, it is just uh, well the Tahara's paper was actually conclusive. Still, some more papers are published. I have already referred to this Takeuchi and Tahara 2007 PNS and Kwon and Zoel 2007 PNS. Then Catalan, remember Catalan? Catalan and Kasha had written a paper, remember? So, Catalan wrote a comment in response to Zoel's paper 2008. And here, since the slides are from Tahara San, he has actually written the, the, the exact timeline. This paper was accepted in 2007, January 12, Zuel's paper in April, on April 3rd, same year. So, Catalan wrote this comment, I encourage you to read it and Zuel wrote a response to the comment and that was the end of the debate. So, well this is very small print, you can read it, here it is blown up for our benefit. So, what Zuel said here is that as we pointed out in our recent publication, another group of researchers stated the concerted mechanism by its definition does not require such a st strict simultaneity. So, what it had boiled down to is it really concerted and are the both going out exactly at time t equal to 0 with at a second resolution. So, Tahara had said no, I mean, who is saying that? It might be that there is a little bit of difference, but you cannot make out. The fact remains that that initial 0 0.2 picosecond component is not the first proton transfer. So, they discussed a little bit about symmetry breaking. And then this is where uh, this is a statement of yielding. At the end, it seems not profitable to have in the scientific literature the same claims in different colors, and we hope that this letter will be the epilogue, and it was. So, that brings us to the end of this decade long uh, discussion on what seemed to be what might seem to be uh, an outsider a debate of no consequence, but actually that is very wrong approach. This is an engrossing debate because it teaches you several things, some scientific and at least one philosophical. The scientific uh, thing that we learn is, we learn how to handle situations like this where you have closely lying states, what are the experiments you need to do, how do you analyze your data to come up with an explanation that is uh, that differentiates states, the difference of which is really, really subtle. A less careful experiment would completely miss this. So, this body of literature that has been produced teaches us specifically those in the ultra fast dynamics field, but also generally in other fields of how experiments should be done, how data should be analyzed and how questions should be asked to understand a problem that is not easy to solve. And the philosophical outcome of this is 
published paper is not gospel truth. Just because somebody has said something in a paper, we cannot say oh, that is published, so it is right. That is completely wrong. Science progresses as uh, a result of series of mistakes. People do something, they interpret it in such a way and more often than not it is wrong. Rutherford theory was wrong. Was it completely wrong? It was not completely wrong. Because after all there is a nucleus and there is an electron outside the nucleus. But this uh, planetary motion and all that is wrong. Both theory was wrong. But were it not done, we would not have reached the present state of the art. So, somebody who has won Nobel Prize or is about to win Nobel Prize, it is not necessary that whatever he says is the absolute truth. And even if you are Goliath or less than Goliath in front of that David, if we are convinced about what we are saying, we should have the metal of taking it forward and following through until the epilogue comes. Right? So, uh, that is why I am really very uh, fond of this uh, debate and I thought uh, we will discuss it as a, as a part of this course. That brings us to, a, uh, to an end of whatever we wanted to say about molecules. Of course, what we have presented on molecules again is the tip of the iceberg. We have not discussed the vast body of literature that exists on say things like uh, photoisomerization. There is another story in itself, you can teach half a course on it. So, all that I mean I leave to uh, you to uh, read, but since in any case we are coming to the end of the course uh, in a few more modules, maybe 15 more modules, what we will do is we will move on to uh, metal nanoclusters after this and then to, to metal nanoparticles and uh, semiconductor nanoparticles and then we will discuss uh, 2D electronics, uh, 2D electronic and uh, IR one of those spectroscopy and perhaps we will come back to Tahara Sun's work as well and we will discuss what is called some frequency generation at the surface. That is again a classical problem that has been uh, reinvented and new sites have been achieved in the last 15 years. Okay? That will bring us to the end of the course.